Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of Sunnah Followers Tahi class. And we are discussing in detail exactly what it means to truly believe in Allah. Because as Muslims, we all say that we believe in Allah and we only worship him. But as I am showing through this series of lectures, you know, it's easy to say it, but when we look at how we live our lives, we find that we are doing many things that fall in the category of associating partners with Allah. And the sad reality is that should you die, a person having associated partners with Allah and not repent it, then all your good deeds will be in vain. You will be a person that the prophet speaks about who is bankrupt. That means you will stand before Allah with nothing good in your favor. So we don't want to be bankrupt. So that's why as Muslims, we must on a regular basis check our belief system to assure that it is correct. And yesterday, we spoke about certain things uh, that many uh, people indulge in or engage in uh, that uh, can actually uh, 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 destroy their belief system. And one of them is uh, swearing to do things and then not follow through. And we talked about this in detail yesterday, how so many of us are quick to make promises. We make promises to do things and we'll go so far as to swear by a law that we'll do these things and then we don't. Well, this is a serious sin. It brings about the curse of a law upon yourself. And also we talked about how some people say that they believe in Allah and his oneness, but whenever we find ourselves faced with, with trials or calamities or we're in need of help, we go seeking help from places other than he. Okay, so let's look at the, the questions on the screen today from yesterday to see how well you understood what we discussed. And here's a scenario, Abdullah, he swore that he would fast for a, an entire month straight without breaking his fast. If a law would, would allow for him to get a new job. Well, he kept making dua and he finally got that new job. And now he has to keep that, that promise he made to a law, but he doesn't want to. What can he do? Can he break it? Why or why not? What do you guys think? Abdullah swore, he promised that he would fast for an entire month straight without breaking it. If Allah would just give him this job he applied for. Well, he got the job and now he had to keep the promise, but he doesn't want to. Can he break it? Why or why not? Who can answer this question? Simple question. To be honest, every Muslim should know this answer. Can, do you know the answer? Let's see your answers. I said, no, he cannot break his oath because he didn't make an oath to do a sinful action. And whenever we swear by a law to do actions that are lawful, we have to go through it, whether we want to or not. Um, and then a law tells us in the Quran about, you know, the believers that there are those who fulfill their vows. And then the Prophet وسلم, says that whoever makes a vow to be obedient to Allah, he should be obedient to him. And whoever makes a vow to disobey Allah, he should not disobey him. Okay, good answer. Do you guys agree with her? Does anyone out there that disagrees with her answer? She said that, yes, he has to keep it. He cannot break it. And she gave uh, uh, evidences. Anybody disagree with her answer? Anybody else? Sister Zainab, what do you think? Yasmin, what do you think? Sabrine, what do you think? Omar here, what do you think? 
Muslima, Layla, Aisha, Ikra. I agree with her. I agree with what she said. Okay, Awa agrees with her. Anybody disagrees? What about on Facebook? Yes, I agree with her too. Okay, everybody disagrees. So there's no one who disagrees. Okay, her answer is wrong. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of you agreed and her answer is wrong. Can anybody figure out what's wrong with her answer? She said, mm -hmm. can anybody figure out what's wrong with her answer? I was going to say the one month fasting. Is that what's wrong with the answer? Yeah, she figured it out herself. Where in Islam does it say that we can fast for a month straight without breaking our fast? This is haram. We just went over a hadith yesterday where the prophet came to one of the companions and said, I fast and I break my fast. It's haram for us to fast nonstop, guys. That's what the Jews and Christians, the Christians do. They don't eat or drink for months and they lose weight and shrivel up and die. We have to break our fast. It's haram for us to fast non uh, 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 for a month straight without breaking it. Nobody caught that in her answer, so this is wrong. And so the dalil she gave applies to what the prophet said, with ever a person swears. If a per the prophet said, let me put it here, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, if a person swears, or vows to do something haram, then he or she should, must break it. He didn't say should, he said must break it. And do what, Meleon? Not only must you break the fast, but what else, Meleon? Not only must you break the fast if you swear to do something haram, but what else? Nobody can remember we've had this hadith a, a million times over the past 30 years. When it comes to swearing and making vows, Omar here, not only must you break it, but what else? You must repent it and- um, You must what? To repent. No, to well now what must you do guys when you break a oath? You, I mean, you must, when you swear to do something haram, you must break the oath and what else? Is that be an expiation? Um, the correct answer is pay. It's not repent. It's pay, pay the expiation. The expiation is repentance. And what is the expiation for breaking an oath, uh, AWOC? Um, is that um, either the um, free a slave? And if we don't have a slave, it's um, a feed a person. Yes, um, if I, you either fast for 30, fast for 30 days, you fast, but this is the problem. We can't fast nonstop. That's called a whistle. It's when you fast without breaking it. If a person swears an oath, to do something haram, not only must he break the oath, but also pay the expiation, which is either fast for 30 days, the way Allah said to fast, or free a slave, or feed the poor. Does everybody understand? Okay, so you never swear to do something haram. Okay, it's haram for us to fast nonstop. Does everybody understand what fasting nonstop is? And that's what the question said, without breaking. We break our fast. We fast from, from dawn until sunset. We do not continuously fast without breaking it. Okay, everybody understand that. Y'all got to remember these hadiths. Every Muslim is supposed to know the expiation for breaking an oath. Okay, question number two. Abdullah's car breaks down while he is traveling through the mountains. He calls upon the believing jinn for help. Is this lawful? And a lot of Muslims do this. You're on a trip with your family. 
<clears throat> you get a flat tire while you're going through the desert or through the mountains or any place where the jinn live. So a lot of people will make dua asking the believing Muslim jinn in that area to come and help them. Is this lawful? Who can answer this question? People do it all the time. Is it lawful? Anyone? Abdullah's car breaks down while he's traveling through the mountains. He calls upon the believing jinn. I remember one time about 10, 15 years ago, I was going on a vacation. You know, everybody knows until the COVID came, COVID's changed everybody's life. I used to go to the mountains of Tennessee, you know, um, three times a year with my grandkids and my mother. And I remember uh, uh, I went with my brother Issa one time, okay? And I took his wife and his uh, children. Okay, we were going up that mountain. We were going, we were at the top of a mountain in a cabin that was at the top of a mountain. It was a big, hard, long climb. And when we were going up that mountain, I remember me and Issa was talking and we was talking about this. There's a lot of people. He said, even believe it or not, even in Saudi Arabia, because he had just got back from Saudi Arabia. Well, he lived that for a few years. He said, do you know, even in Saudi Arabia, you know, when they're going up uh, through the desert, you know, people will do this. They'll make dua asking the believing jinn, you know, to help them up that mountain or to help them, you know, whatever. Is this lawful? Anybody want to answer? No, no. Is and how lawful? do we answer here? You better answer correctly. We just don't say no. We don't, we don't just we say don't, yes. We don't call upon any um, Allah creation. This is association partner with Allah. And Allah already told us in the Quran, he did not create a mankind and jinn except to worship him. So um, this is not, uh, is, is a shirk. Exactly. A Good job. And she gave her evidence. Okay, this is lawful. No, this is not lawful. Allah says, call upon him for help to call upon anyone else is associating partners with him. And believe it or not, there's a lot of Muslims all over the world, even in Saudi Arabia, they do that. Because you in the desert, you know, that's where the jinn lives. So you're going to ask the jinn, the believing jinn amongst that out there to come and help you. Because you driving through a graveyard or you walking through a graveyard and you trip and fall. I know Muslims who do this because you tripped and fell in the graveyard. You're going to ask the believing jinn to help you to walk out. We don't do that. And like I told you, there's one supplication in that book y'all like. You know, there are a lot of uh, Arabic people I know recite and my group and fantasy here asking the uh, angels of their right shoulder to come and, and, and save them and protect them. A stuck fear law. We don't call upon the angels. We don't call upon the jinn. We call only upon Allah. Everybody got it? So this is shirk. Don't call upon nothing for help except Allah. As she said, we were created to worship Allah, including the jinn. The jinn can't be of no more help to you than any than a bumblebee, unless Allah allows it. Good job. And let's look at the last question. What about calling for help from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is this lawful? It, it's lawful to seek help from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is that true or false? What do you guys think about that one? That's false. Oh, false. Um, this is unlawful. Um, you shouldn't seek help from anyone except the law. We have a hadith where like, um, there was a hypocrite that lived during the time of the prophet. Um, some of them decided to, you know, take their complaints to the prophet, asking them to like help, um, asking him to help them against the hypocrite. And the prophet told them, look, none, none of you guys should be asking me for help because the law is the one who should, who you should like ask for help. Only he can benefit you because I'm just a man. 
Exactly. That hadith is the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi proved this with his own words. He said, you guys are having a problem with the hypocrites. Don't come to me. Don't call upon me for help. I'm in the same predicament as you. Instead, take your pleas for help to Allah. Call upon Allah because I can do no more to stop the hypocrites from hurting you like I can't stop them from hurting me. They're hurting me too. They're slandering my wives. They're slandering me. They're slandering all of us. So take your supplications to Allah. This is when the hypocrites are writing poems, bad poems like they do today about Muslim women and how we look because we cover up and all of that. They were slandering the prophet's wives and slandering the Muslim women and, and, and all that nonsense that they still do today. And like the prophet told them then, it's the same thing we tell you now, take your complaints to Allah. Allah is the one that can help and protect, not anyone else. So not, we don't even call upon the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But believe it or not, there's a lot of a misguided Muslims out there who do that. This is haram. This is associating partners with Allah. So as you guys can see, just from what we discussed yesterday, even though there are, we all as Muslims say that we only believe la ilaha illallah, that there's only one God and that God is Allah, there's certain things that we do in our everyday lives that invalidate that belief. And this is why we have to really be careful this is why the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us to check yourself check yourself before you do a deed and check yourself afterwards before you do a good deed make sure you're doing it with the right intentions and then even after you've done it check and make sure you follow you did it the way a law legislated does everybody understand? We have to check ourselves, just like I do every day here with these classes. I come in here and teach every day. Before I teach, I check myself. I check my PowerPoint. I check my Dalil to make sure everything is correct. If I'm confused, I'll call Sheikh Morsi and check to make sure I got it right, okay? And then after the class, every night, I'll sit up here and play the, the lectures back to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. So if I did, I can correct that or I'll listen to how I respond to the answer. If I think I was too hard on somebody, I'll go clean that up with them. You know, we have to always check ourselves before and after, because again, it's easy to say we believe in Allah. But like the Allah says, just because you say you believe ain't enough. Our personal jinn, he never sleeps and he would do everything in his power you know, to cause us to make our good deeds in vain. So we have to be on guard. And the way to be on guard is like the prophet said, by checking ourselves. Okay, any questions about any of those answers? And for those of you who have that book of supplications, there's a lot of supplications in that book, like the one I just said, that are not right. And remember the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best supplication is the one from your heart that you make up for yourself. You don't have to, I remember when I went to make Hajj, there were people walking around the Kaaba reading from a book. And I was like, what are they reading? That they're reading that book of supplication. Why don't they make their own supplications? They're not intelligent. They don't know that they can. No one knows your situation or your condition better than yourself. So you make your own supplication. Now the supplications that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to say for, our, uh, for specific situations, that's different. We can use those. Just like the incantations that he taught us to say when we get stung by a bee or stung by an insect, we can use those. But for your personal stuff, oh, Lord, I got cancer going on here. You know, you don't got to flip through that book of doors saying, Annie, my gloob and fantasy. You better sit there and talk to Allah from your heart about your own self. When you're making hard, you know, you want to be forgiven for the sins you committed. Speak to Allah. 
from yourself. You don't need to go flipping through a book looking for a specific one. Now, if you're going to use a specific one for a specific situation, the Prophet ﷺ gave us some, like for depression, for anxiety, and stuff like that. But to get personal, every Muslim should have their own ibadah, their own personal relationship with Allah. I have my relationship with him. Do you have yours? Where you can sit down and talk to Allah anytime you want to. And you don't need nobody to write it out for you. Everybody understand that? That's what that hadith means when the prophet says the best supplication is the supplication from your heart because no one knows your situation better than you. Okay? All right. Let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen for today's discussion, because just as we talked about yesterday, people say that they believe in Allah, but they associate partners with him when it comes to seeking, seeking help and when it comes to seeking refuge. They also associate partners when it comes to their fear. And you guys hear me talking about this all the time. There's a lot of Muslims out there that fear something more than Allah. Fear belongs to Allah, not to his creation. Like I said, those Muslims out there who have not yet taken uh, uh, the corona uh, vaccine. You ask these idiot Muslims, why haven't you taken the corona vaccine? And they say, oh, I'm afraid of America. America tracking me or making me a zombie, or I'm afraid because I don't know what's in it. You don't know what's in Tylenol either. You ain't a doctor. Allah says he reveals knowledge to the people who, who, who are worthy of it. You ain't no medical doctor. If you did know what was in Tylenol, you wouldn't know what that stuff is. Like I said yesterday, most Muslims don't even know that gelatin comes from other sources in a pig. So now you think you a doctor and can figure out about chemistry. You know, take the vaccine because the law said take the treatment. I reveal the treatment to those qualified to understand it and know how to put it together. You just take it. That's what the law says. You just take it. Okay, but no, your fear is not of a law. Okay, let's look at the PowerPoint. For some reason, I can't get this right. Okay, a law says in the Quran, in the interpretation of the meanings, do they associate partners to a law? Those who created nothing, but they create, but but they themselves are created. Don't they understand that no help can they give to anyone, nor can they even help themselves again? One of the beliefs in Allah, you say you believe in Allah, that means you have to believe that nothing can harm you and nothing can benefit you unless Allah allows it. That's why we don't fear anyone. We don't fear anyone over Allah because no one can hurt you unless Allah allows them to do that. Okay, also Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, and those whom you call upon instead of Allah, they own not even a membrane over a date stone. If you call upon them, they don't even hear you. And if they were to hear, they couldn't grant you your request anyway. And on the day of judgment, they will disown your worshiping them. And no one can inform you, O Muhammad, like him who is the all hearing, the all knowing. So here Allah is saying again, for those people who go around calling upon Jesus, calling upon the jinn, calling upon Ali or Muhammad or anything else, they don't hear you, number one. They don't hear your calls, number one. And even if they could hear you, they weren't in no a position to help you. Subhanallah. Allah. And on the day of judgment, they will disown you. Everybody understand that. Very important verses here. And we have a hadith, whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was hit uh, uh, on the day of the Battle of Uhud 
and one of his teeth became broken. And he, when he spit his tooth out, he said, SubhanAllah, how can people, a, a, a nation of people succeed when they hit their own prophet? And that's when Allah sent down the verse saying, it's not for you, O Muhammad, but instead for Allah. In other words, Allah is the one. You know, you're just a prophet. You're just a man that I sent to call the people to me. But you have no power, you know, to benefit or, or to harm unless I give you that ability. And also we have another hadith, whereas Ibn Umar said he heard the Prophet wasalam, say when he was praying one day, he said, uh, he made dua, he said, oh Allah, curse so-and-so. Because this is one of the, the, uh, the Quraysh who were fighting against him. They did, this is after they had um, uh, 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 thrown um, 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 dung and stuff, you know, on him with his daughter Fatima witnessing it. So he cursed them. And that's when Allah said, he was telling them, you can curse them all you want to, but unless I choose to curse them, it ain't nothing gonna happen to them. So again, nothing happens, bad or good, unless Allah allows it. We can supplicate and supplicate and supplicate, but it's not gonna happen unless Allah allows it. That's why we should only fear him. And then there's another hadith where the prophet uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua against Safwan ibn Umayyah and Suhail ibn Amir and al Harith ibn Hisham. And again, Allah said, it's not for you to decide. I decide whether I'm gonna punish them or not. Okay, so even though Islam allows us Islam allows us as Muslims to curse those who oppress us. We understand that the decision to punish them lies with Allah. Does everybody understand that? That doesn't mean that we can't supplicate because the prophet supplicated against the unbelievers. Whenever the companions were, the Muslims were going through a war, the prophet would make the canute, you know, the canute supplication. And we're allowed to do that, but understand nothing's gonna happen unless Allah decides when and if. Does everybody understand that? And I remember uh, when I first started giving dawah on this internet back in 1986, I went through so much rancor. Oh my God, the people were attacking me so crazy, slandering my character and all kind of stuff. And I made do against these people. I made do against these oppressors. They continued to harass me for 10, 15 years. These were Muslims harassing me and slandering me and made websites against me for 15 years. It took 15, but I kept making my do against them and subhanAllah. Some of them died now, some of them were murdered, some of them were killed. A lot of them apostated, subhanAllah. A lot of those women and men are not even Muslims today. You know, so, you know, you can make the supplication against those who oppress you, but understand the decision of whether or when they will be punished lies with Allah. And Allah let the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know this. Also, we have a hadith that's recorded also in Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Huraira. He said, one day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up and Allah sent down a revelation saying, warn your tribe and warn your family, O Muhammad. And that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O people of the Quraysh, he said, I will not be of any help to you before Allah. Oh, Abbas, that was his uncle. I will not be of any help to you before Allah. Oh, Sophia, that was his aunt. I won't be able to help you either. And oh, Fatima, that was his daughter. Ask, ask for my money, whatever you want to ask, but I will not be of no help before you, I mean, for you to you before Allah. So the prophet let it be known that even on the day of judgment, the decision lies with Allah, not with him, not with him. He will not be of any help to anyone, not even his own relatives, not even his own daughter on a day of judgment. Whatever we reap in this world, 
Whatever we reap in this world, we're going to have to suffer the consequences of our choices with the law. And no one can help us or save us then. The decision of what will happen to you or me for the choices we made, it all lies with the law. So we learn a lot from these hadiths and this, these two verses of the Quran. We learn, first of all, uh, there's nothing wrong with making supplication against those who oppress you. And the Quraysh did horrific things, you know, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. And we also learn there's nothing wrong with the, uh, the, the Kanut, which is calling upon Allah against uh, people in times of disaster. And also we learn there's nothing wrong with naming the ones who are the, the worst oppressors against you too. And finally, we learn though, even though we make our supplications, the decision to punish, the decision of retribution, the decision of vindication, all of that lies only with Allah, not with you, me, or the prophet Muhammad even. Remember guys, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, when fear is banished from their hearts, they say. When fear is banished from their hearts, they say, what is it that your Lord has said? And they say, they reply the truth. And he is the most high and the most great. Okay, we have the hadith, whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when Allah decrees, when Allah decrees something to happen, the angels beat their wings and submit to whatever he's saying. And their wings beat so loudly that it sounds like a chain being dragged on the rocks. They stand before him in fear, awaiting to hear whatever it is that he has to say to them. And they say, what is it? What is it that Allah said? And then Jibreel will say, Allah has spoken the truth. And then they, they listen. You know, they stand in awe and they stand in fear of whatever Allah will command them to do. And at the same time, we have the evil jinn they sit, but God, hold on, people. We have the evil jinn that sit beneath the lowest level of the heavens, eavesdropping in on what Allah says to the angels, trying to steal the information that Allah gives to them, and Allah will then send a, a, a meteorite to knock them down but the jinn will take what they heard Allah say and give it to uh, the magicians. So that's how the magicians can tell you, oh, it's going to rain on September 9th, but they mix lies with it because the jinn add other lies to it. So again, this hadith shows that even the angels, even the angels stand before Allah in fear. And they've done nothing wrong. But if they stand awaiting what Allah says in fear, what does that say about you and me? We live our lives on this earth fearing others besides Allah. You would know that Allah said alcohol and drugs is haram, but you still smoke. You still drink. You know that Allah commanded for you as a Muslim woman to cover your body in the public but you have no fear, you still walk around out of hijab on. You know that Allah has commanded you as a man to provide and maintain your family and to treat your wife with dignity, but you still abuse her and you still don't do your job. We have no fear of Allah, but those angels who don't even have free will, who ain't got to worry about going to hell, they stand before him in awe and fear whenever he gives a command. Shows how twisted we are as human beings. Also in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when Allah wishes to reveal something to man, he speaks out the words to be revealed. 
and the heavens will shake strongly out in fear of him. And when the words of Allah fall upon the inhabitants of the heavens, they are taken by shock and they fall and prostrate before him. And the first of them to raise his head is the angel Jabril, whom Allah speaks about. Then Jabril goes and passes to, by the other angels and tells them whatever it is that Allah said. And now a lot of people say, let's use this coronavirus, the vaccine. Allah says in the Quran, any virus, any virus that befalls this earth, it comes from him. How? He's the one that gives the knowledge of its creation to whoever he wills. So you see this hadith in play. Allah, when he wishes to reveal something to man, he speaks out the words to be revealed. So he'll say, man, bad man over here in China. He will have, he said, I want that bad man over there in China to create this coronavirus because I need to send, put a virus on earth because the, the humans have become so corrupt, the Muslims too. So I need to cleanse the earth of these wicked people. And I need to test to see who's the true believer and who isn't. So he'll say, Jabril, go to that man in China. Give him the knowledge of how to put in a test tube the chemicals that will formulate a virus known as COVID. And Jabril does that. Jabril goes and reveals that knowledge, make that virus known as COVID. Take this, this agent, that agent, mix it together and bam. And then Allah tells us when he wants the virus to uh, spread throughout the earth, he causes the jinn. So he'll say, Jabril, now I want you to tell the jinn to spread that virus all over the entire earth because there's jinn that fly through the sky. We can't see them, but they're flying around now. There's jinn that travel with the speed faster than the speed of light. So the jinn, they spread the virus. Some people die. Some people live, but Allah says, understand this. I will never send a virus to you without also sending a treatment. So Jabril, I want you to go to this part of the earth, to those doctors that are working in that laboratory and reveal to them the treatment for the COVID. The, the, reveal to them what agents to mix together that will end up serving as a treatment. And that's what Jabril does. He goes and whispers, put chemical A with chemical B, mix it together, add this, add that, bam, it's a treatment. It ain't a cure, but it's a treatment. And then Allah says, whenever I send the treatment, take it. Take it. And if you take it, maybe, maybe I will send a cure. We don't have a cure for the coronavirus right now because everybody ain't even taking it. There's more Muslims out there who ain't taking it than anybody else because Muslims are just plain stupid. The prophet said we don't have the intelligence that the Christians and Jews have. We're walking around fearing America or fearing cause like you a doctor, like if they told you that chemis, 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 the chemical element of Z mixed with chemical element L is what's in the bars, like you know what that is. You ain't no doctor, you take the treatment. But this hadith shows how Allah sends what he wants us to know. When Allah wants man to have knowledge of things, he speaks it out 
to the angels in the heavens and they shake in fear of him. And it's Jabril who will then carry it out and then give that knowledge to whoever Allah said, give it to. As, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said here in this authentic hadith, Jabril moves on to the destination with the revelation to wherever Allah commanded. So there from the hadith of your prophet, there's your, your coronavirus, just like the tuberculosis, just like all the other viruses we've had, the flu. All that stuff comes from Allah. He gives that knowledge to mankind through the angel Jabril. And like Allah said, if you believe in me, then you will do what I say do and take whatever treatment because I'm never. That shows how merciful Allah is. Allah is so merciful, guys. He tells us that he will never send a virus without sending a treatment. We had the treatment for polio. That was a virus. We had the treatment for and the cure for tuberculosis and, the, and all that. Allah sent the treatment and cures for those other viruses, the bubonic plague, mononucleosis, all that stuff. These are all viruses. He promised out of his mercy, he'll always send a treatment. All you have to do if you believe in him is do what he said and take his treatment. And then maybe he'll do like he did with the tuberculosis and stuff. He'll send a cure. Just that simple. So yes, the coronavirus may have been invented in a laboratory in China, but where did the knowledge of it come from? Allah, he said, Jabril, take it to that man over there. Give that doctor right there in China the knowledge of how to put together a virus that'll wipe these people out because I need to cleanse this earth of bad people. And I need to test these Muslims to see who amongst them truly believe in me and who the, the associations, people that associate with me are. Many of you have proven to be people who associate because y'all ain't getting the cure, getting the treatment. But that's how it happens. And this is the hadith that proves it. So this is what Allah does when he wants something to be revealed to us here on earth. And Jabril is the one that goes to the destination with the revelation right there. So thus, what do we learn from this wonderful hadith and all the others today? Well, you learn that the angel Jabril, he's the head honcho. He answers to all the angels of the heavens. They all come to him and question him. And he's the one that Allah will tell, take my message here, take my message there. Also, you learn that the angels, even though they don't have free will, even though they're not held accountable like us, they still fear Allah. If they have fear of Allah, what does that say about you and me who don't? And again, we learn that the angel Jabril, he conveys whatever the revelation is to wherever Allah say, take it. It could be to that scientist in China or that, that doctor here in America. And we also learn that even the gen E's drop in on the, on the heavens. They try to steal information about what Allah is saying. And you also learn that the jinn take what they hear and mix it with the falsehood and give it to the soothsayers. So again, guys, this religion, Islam, Islam is a beautiful way of life, perfected for us by Allah. There is nothing that impacts us here in this world that Allah has not warned us of, that Allah has not told us about. It's just that we have to educate ourselves correctly, correctly. We have to be careful who we take our knowledge of Islam from. There's a lot of people out there calling themselves Daya, but how many of them are doing what I'm doing? Anything I teach y'all, y'all see, I back it up with the Hadiths. That's why I use PowerPoint. 
I don't sit up here and just talk and try to pose for the camera and be beautiful. No, I'm going to have my PowerPoint always. So you can see, I don't make up these Hadiths. The Hadiths were already here. I just know how to go get them because Allah blessed me with that knowledge and I can show them to you, teach them to you, explain them to you. Again, we don't fear anyone or anything more than Allah. For those of you who do, you need to check your belief system. Do what Allah said. Go out there and get those shots. If you qualify for the booster shot, because they have the booster shot now, if you are over 65 years old and you have, or you have diabetes, cancer, or some other a, a debilitation or a limb, dis, a limb removed or something, contact your doctor and go get that booster shot. And then maybe, maybe, as Allah said, he'll send us a cure. But you got to fear him. Fear disobeying him. Don't fear what's in the shot. Because whatever's in the shot, Allah told them to put it in there. I just gave you the evidence. Whatever is in the shot, it came from Allah. Hello? Trust in him. And as far as what's going to happen after I take it, fear him. If you live in a good life, you shouldn't be concerned with what's going to happen after you take it. If you're doing everything that you're supposed to do as a Muslim, should you die, you die in peace with a good ending. But if you live in your life twisted and hypocritical, then yeah, I guess you should be afraid. But be afraid of not taking it because the chances of your dying is, is, is greater by not taking it than taking it. Hello. All right, we're going to stop right here for today. Uh, I want to remind everybody that for those uh, beginner people who are learning how to read uh, the Quran in Arabic, the beginner class will be tonight at 730. And, and I'm the one teaching that. Make sure you guys are in my Zoom room uh, for the beginners who, who these are the people who have now learned the alphabet. They learned the alphabet and I'm going to have them reading. So Make sure you guys are in the Zoom room at 7.30, inshallah. Okay, subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha ila anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.